broadcasting services. And one of the things that I was really um, trying to do and achieve whilst I was still there was to create a platform for more people in Zimbabwe to have not only access to art, but also conversations around, around art and how important art is um, in, in curating history as it evolves and as it happens. Um, and so I'm really um, honored to be your guest moderator for today. And today we're gonna to be in conversation with Olivia Botha. Olivia, welcome, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Fantastic. So before we get into like the formal, I don't think formal is the right word, but until before we get into conversation, how how have you been? Um, where are you? And you know, what month of lockdown are you in? <laughs> <laughs> all right um I, i've been all right i must say um i yeah i'm now in johannesburg south africa and um which is where i'm from well i'm from cape town but i'm you know this is the first time really living in joburg um right. and i was living in uh bulawayo for about i think it was about a year with my partner who's also an artist, a Zimbabwean artist, and um, yeah, so that's like, it's quite amazing to have had that experience. Um, and I quite miss Zim quite a lot and the people and, and everything about it. So, right. but um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a right. Jopik is a, it's such a like crazy space. Like I'm still trying to get used to it. And it's been, I think this will be my second year by the end of the year. Wow, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you to everybody that, that's joining. So today's conversation, geez, conversation <laughs> uh, is focusing on having two tongues um, and strategizing for survival. So when I first got this opportunity, I was like having two tongues. I mean, I, mean, I dissected it in, in, in two different ways. Having two tongues, I was like, okay. Um, I looked at it from just the pure linguistics and that I speak three languages. I speak Shona, I speak English, and then I speak a fusion of Shona and English, which is called Shonglish. So <laughs> um, what has been happening for me, I think over the last, just close to a year, was this having to um, relearn certain things about my culture that I didn't learn because I was either not introduced to it, um, or I was experiencing this, because I'm from my Nikolai, so I was experiencing this, um, like, dude, who are you? Um, and, and, and how you speak and represent yourself. So that was the first, the first way I, I unpacked it. And strategizing for survival was really realizing that, okay, we're on, to be honest, I've lost count. So we'll just call it week 34 of lockdown, realizing that he, there actually has to be a strategy for survival, whether it's during lockdown or it's survival from so many different things. So I think to start us off, um, Olivia, obviously one for the purpose of people that aren't acquainted with, with your work or your art, can you start us off by a bit of, of your journey around um, your, your, your form of you know, artistic expression and then how we are here today about having two tongues and strategizing survival. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, it's kind of a loaded, long, like a <laughs> big question, but <laughs> I mean, I love what you were saying, and I think I understand you correctly with um, your third language, which is like, is it Shona and English, kind of a combination of the, the two? Shonglish, yep. Okay, I love that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we did, if you have two tongues, right, which is exactly what I'm trying to say with that piece is, uh, you know, it's, it's having two languages, uh, literally, but also kind of being tongue tied with both of them in certain points, and then having to, you know, bring those two languages together. So also right. being, you know, Afrikaans and English, and then, you know, I, I don't speak pure Afrikaans. So it's like always bringing English in. And even when I'm speaking English, I kind of think of, oh, what's this word? This is like a great word in Afrikaans. What is the English, you know, kind of like, right. how can you kind of meet, yeah, merge those two? Um, so that's been quite interesting, just working with this idea of language um, and also 
this idea of translating, um, yeah. you know, whether it's like literal translation or just, you know, sometimes in my work, I would look at an image and I would kind of translate it onto the paper or canvas or whatever I'm using. And that's right. also kind of a, like a visual translation. I'm um, all the things that get lots uh, get sorry get <laughs> get uh, lost in translation, which I think is also really interesting and it's quite beautiful, um, and how that then completely changes the narrative. So right. I started. There was I'm trying to think because I was like I never knew that languages or language was kind of a fundamental thing in my practice. But right. it was with um, it was was a it was a, a workshop that I did um, in Harare at the National Gallery, and um, it was with Simon Jami and Andrew uh, Chebango, and it was yeah it was great. It was uh, basically at work, um, and yep. it's part of the Moleskine Foundation. And so the the real the thing that it kind of happened for me in that workshop which was like five day intensive workshop sure. was this idea of literally like taking like almost like a poem in a way that I wrote in my mother tongue uh then translated to English and then basically got everyone to translate that piece uh like in English again but so kind of using the, the translation and then tr translating that into their mother tongue and then translating that into English again. So it's like multiple layers of translation um, right. with the idea of it getting kind of lost and and changing completely. Um, right. Yeah, so that's like kind of bits and bobs of it. Sure. It's kind of like when you were talking about, um, you know, having multi layers of translation. I don't know about, you know, where, where, about where you come from, but have you heard of uh, the game that we used to play, uh, Broken Telephone, how, yes. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of a lot of meaning that is either lost in translation, yeah. or because when somebody receives it, and I think that's the, the, the beautiful thing about the work that you do as a multidisciplinary artist is that um, there's so many, like multi multifaceted interpretation. It's like three dimensional um, in, in the, the poem that you had, and then it was in your mother's tongue. Then you translated it and it just like morphed into this whole experience. Now, one thing that I also wanted to ask is as somebody who's a multidisciplinary artist, so you worked in video performance, installation, collage, and painting. Um, talk to us around those processes. Because again, when you look at the, the different layers of translation in being being tongue-tied, um, do you go through the same processes? And when I say processes, um, I'm saying from conceptualization to how you internalize what you're doing and then, you know, eventually coming out with the product. How, how, how is that process across the different, um, the different, the different um, way that you do art? Good question. I think, um, you know, I like collecting things. I think a lot of artists like collecting. Um, and it's, I think it's also part of our human nature. Like we just want to have things around us and it doesn't have to be of value, but it, if there's something that, you know, you connect with that thing, whether it's an object or, you know, uh, an idea, um, you kind of want to keep it close to you. Mm. So, yeah, I think, you know, with my kind of installation works, um, mostly it is found objects to a degree so that's quite quite a big part of the work and of course with collage it's the same you know you're kind of collecting and trying to put it together like a puzzle um and i guess the same with painting and things like that um like i was saying earlier with the translation kind of idea so it's for me it's quite it's it's almost like a I wonder how I can put it. <laughs> See, this is where you get <laughs> tongue tied. <or> tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yep. yeah, it's like it's it is sometimes hard to put your practice into words, and I think that's also part of where that kind of idea comes from. But yeah, it's like a 
more of a, a feeling that you get. So uh, mm. when I see an image that I'm drawn to for some reason, um, I kind of, I would look at the image and I would, you know, relate it, translate it onto paper, but not really looking at what I'm doing or just looking at what I'm doing, not really looking at the image. It's kind of this like, I'm almost blindfolded in a way, like <laughs> I'm looking at something, but I'm not looking at the other thing. So it's not trying to sure. copy something. It's really just, there was like an essence to that image that spoke to me. Um, right. Yeah, and and I think that's that's why I'm saying, you know, it's, it's this idea of collecting physical things, but also more sensations. Um, and I think that's the great thing about an installation you know, you can really get and create a feeling. Um, mm. Well, I hope so, at least. I don't know. <laughs> when that happens, I don't know. But that's the idea. Um, right. But yeah. you mentioned something that's so important. And I was like, wow, a light bulb moment. Um, mm. Was that language or feelings are also a form of language. Um, mm. Because, you know, you cannot necessarily articulate it or write it down. But it rouses a response um, in a certain way. Um, and then when you write, right, or when somebody writes um, a piece or a poem, you are pouring out part of you, you're pouring your emotion, your feelings, right? Um, and you obviously can't, you can't um, predict, that's the word, you can't predict how the next person is, is gonna receive it. So you're probably pouring out, you've had you know, a really hectic day and you're pouring out, and when somebody else receives it, they're like, oh, okay, cool. That was really nice. So now we mentioned being tongue-tied and working, being blindfolded, right? Now with this aha moment that you just presented to us, at least to me, that feeling is also a form of a language. When you create the work that you're doing, especially now as we, you know, maybe perhaps tie in, um, you know, strategizing for survival, how do you maybe if it's something that you do do or um or what in what way could we start looking at how we can harness our feelings in what we create to help us survive or create better strategies for survival that's a like long-winded question <laughs> <laughs> that's like next level question <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I have the answer for that at all, but uh, great. Yeah, I think it's an awesome kind of place to start to think about it. Um, yeah, gosh, I think, uh, you know, it's also like for me, I, and you, you started playing the song in the beginning and that's like another form, you know, of feeling is listening to music or you know, listening to a sound um, or the absence of it. Um, and I think that's that's the, the, the amazing thing about um, making art, whatever art form it is. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm gonna answer it, but I'm just gonna go with my train of thought here. And it's oh, like- I think, I think the train of thought, I think that's kind of, I think from, from it, right? Um, just as you're it's like you're just developing thought isn't it yeah yeah so yeah go for it queen <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> um you know I was I this is the thing that I always think about and I, I guess a lot of artists do again different disciplines uh, a lot of creatives probably as well is this idea of you know is your work or what you're doing is it does it have value and not only in terms of you know, monetary value, but, you know, is there something, is it going to connect to someone? But then we also have to come back to basics. Like, of course we have bills to pay and we live in a capitalist system. Um, mm. So you can't kind of just daydream and <laughs> not think about the like <laughs> logistics of living <laughs> and life. But um, yeah, so that's like a big thing, you know, I always, Kind of wonder why we do these things you know but it's it's kind of also we have to right if you are somehow creative whatever that definition is mm. not that i'm i don't like definitions but um 
you know, if you want to do something and you know, you just have to do it, right? You, and you can't help yourself. Um, and it's not, it doesn't even have to be for putting it out to the world. It could just be for yourself. Um, that already shows that there's some, something really like innate in, and it's like part of who we, who we are as as you know like human beings and it's it's been around for so long as well this this need to create um so i think that's quite interesting and um you know i i think it's also like again going back to music and sound and things like that it has a powerful effect on me like i'm not i can't play any kind of musical instrument or sing or anything like that or even dance but it's <laughs> like yeah. you know, it's like you you get such a great um yeah feeling and energy from that thing you know from from listening to something and i i guess that's also what i'm trying to do when i'm making stuff um yeah, I don't know. What's your thoughts? Like, where do you? Like, what? <laughs> I was about to say, just bring on the pressure back to me. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think, um, like you mentioned, sorry, I'll just give you just like just respond to what you said. Otherwise, I'll forget. Um, what you mentioned, you know, doing stuff, doing stuff for yourself, mm -hmm. um, and I mean. I mean, I've created stuff, like I've painted stuff. Sorry about that. Um, to gift, to gift people. Um, but you know, like you mentioned doing stuff for yourself, I was like, wow. Um, how many artists are actually creating just from a place of pouring out whatever they're feeling for themselves? Um, because from somebody who's not within or directly within, you know, the art scene or involved my day to day about creating stuff for consumption or for mm -hmm. exhibition um that really I really wondered like how oh, these artists you guys create incredible work how much of the incredible work that you put together and share you actually take time and be like oh you know you actually deserve this you've been through so much you've yeah. poured yourself out for so for so many people um, for your part of your heart and your soul is on display at different museums. What do you have left for yourself? So for me, um, when I think of, of strategy for survival, it's now for me realizing that actually certain parts of myself that I need to preserve for myself. Um, and now you realize now that with, with what's happening throughout the world, um, it was kind of like a surprise. There was, like, there was no heads up. Especially for us here in Zoom, we were told on Friday, hey guys, uh, gonna be a lockdown from Monday. What? <laughs> like you don't have like time to to put stuff together. So I think in realizing what you just said, but doing stuff for yourself, I think that's something that's really important. That's something that I'm going to definitely put to task for myself around how am I going to survive? How can you survive when all you've ever done for X amount of years is to pour out and develop and plan because you know how I perceive artists um, is that you're always on the go. You, if you're not building material for the next exhibition, you're researching or you're curating for an installation, you're fine-tuning this, you're doing all of these things. This is my perception, right? But what are you doing to honor yourself? What are you doing to honor the great body of work that everybody else is enjoying except you. And the other thing for me is energy is so important. I I I cook, so I can't cook without music, right? Um, and if I do, I'll probably put sugar instead of salt, right? That's <laughs> how how um how powerful music is um in in adding to that experience um and that and that energy. So just to answer your question, I think moving forward everything that we have ever known has changed i mean i think this conversation is testament to that in that um it's how open are we or how open are you to be able to open other people or other experiences into your space um because that might be the only thing 
that will be the bridge that helps you to survive, whether it's as an institution, as a government, as an artist, is really realizing that collaboration doesn't necessarily only have to be within your sector, it doesn't necessarily have to be within your, your community. So like my brain is like <laughs> right now, I'm like, wow, I never looked at so many different things differently. So yeah. No, that's that's amazing and i think that's that's also you know something that um i was thinking about last night when we had a quick uh, voice note conversation like how and i think i also mentioned this maybe um with in conversation with fazai um and that was when i was writing uh having two tongues which is kind of like a short essay that um we published in a book and i've got it here <laughs> so it's right. it, it is at I don't know if you can see it really curating Johannesburg maybe we can add it <laughs> I, don't know, I think I heard what I love there at the end but um yeah I, I mean I'm really proud of this because it's like it forced me to write about my work in a bit of a longer way than just the usual kind of short write-ups and um you know post university where you are forced to write long essays about your work and then you kind of get I don't know you kind of stop doing that I guess but um what I was going right. to say really is that you know this idea of having a conversation you know versus say writing or versus say a voice note right where a voice note right. is really just a monologue of one person talking and then yeah. one person listening and can't you can't interrupt right you can text back <laughs> like, real quick you can do that <laughs> but it's not a conversation really it's just you know listening and then replying and listening and forgetting a lot of forgetting as well right um <laughs> but um uh, with the conversation it's like there's so much that's happening right and you can't there's a lot of new ideas that come up which is great and and that's obviously the beauty of conversation I think um you know when I'm stuck and when I'm not sure where to go next or what to you know uh research or you know what does this work mean like I have to write about it <laughs> like I have to come <laughs> tell me you know like I have to have a conversation with someone and then it's like okay like it's starting to make sense now um but also there's you know it's almost like you are still kind of curating yourself and correcting yourself and thinking wait I can't say that or um how can I say that better or how you know is this oops that was like embarrassing why did I say that kind of thing like there's all these things that happen like while you're having a conversation and then afterwards like that analyzing like oh why but um yeah so I think it's it's quite interesting I don't know I mean that's a really like like a silly kind of silly thing to even analyze because it's so basic right we have conversations every day but now with the right. lockdown it's, it's been um a bit more limited right i don't know depending on if you're living with other people or not um but yeah i think it is it's quite interesting to kind of think about the basic kind right of thing, right? Of just having a conversation. Sure. yeah definitely and then just speaking of, um, you mentioned um, lockdown has, I think, in many ways. So I don't know about you, like first week of lockdown, people, well, I know people in my family and circle of friends had a bit of, a, oh, man, I didn't realize I actually needed this break. I've been on the go um, for the longest time. So I was inundated with like 30 to one hour calls because everybody had free time right <laughs> you're like catching up with people from junior school and you're like wow we like to share pencils where's this coming from right mm -hmm. um and then now it's like you know 34 <laughs> and you don't know how long um this experience has been and earlier on we spoke about um being tongue-tied and with a lot of what's happening throughout the world in particular what's happening in the U united states mm -hmm. with um the murder of um, that, that African American Floyd. man. Sorry, Floyd. Yeah. What is his name? Yes, yeah, they're Floyd. Um, a lot of people are tongue tied because it's uh, difficult conversations or difficult things to translate. Um, and like you said, now you we are in a space where 
even when you're having a like having this conversation like my mind is like racing like okay wait are we talking about this do we talk about this and what tone are we going to talk about this um and i think i'm trying to trace back and if you could help me or if anybody that's listening could help us trace back to when did we start having to overthink conversation because i think one of the things that lockdown has forced us to do is have difficult conversations and before we can have these difficult conversations as as peers or in the world they start with the conversations we have by ourselves i, I don't know for you um if you've been tongue tied by some of the events that are happening throughout the world uh but also it's one of those things where i'm like sitting by myself i'm like wait what what what's going on Someone was posting on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I was just saw in the chat. I thought someone had a response there. Um, okay. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it is, that's exactly where that idea of tongue tied or not being able to talk and um, like almost like swallowing your tongue kind of, you know, it's like nothing. You, it's, I think that's also where, you know, art and various disciplines of art can help articulate those kind of experiences or those kind of feelings. Um, right. That's, you know, where language and words don't really live up to the experience. Mm, um, so, yeah, I mean, I have been, really consumed with that um and with everything that's been happening and of course um you know it's it happens everywhere right it's like right. It, it's happened here it's happened in zim recently yep. um and we were watching this documentary last night 13th um which, okay. yeah it's just 13th which is okay. uh, part of the 13th amendment, um, which is to have the rights of, to have freedom. Okay. Um, but it kind of, it's like a mini documentary and it just kind of really, you know, it kind of looks at the history of, of slavery and how there's, there's like, I think 20, I don't know, I can't remember the exact stats now, but there's so many people and especially um, African American men who are incarcerated in America, um, and they're like they were saying in this you know documentary, they're the land of the free. But how is that possible if you've got the largest pop, you know population in the whole world um, wow. locked up? You know, like you, you've got so many people who are actually locked up. Um, so it's it's a really interesting kind of documentary that I that opened a lot for me and um, you know I think it's also um, acknowledging your privilege right as a white woman what are the privileges that I have um, right. having to also kind of face this yeah it's like a I think there's a great book um, white fragility or you know I can't remember I need to look it up again but it's okay. it's such an important thing because it's obviously it is a difficult subject right and I think a lot of people need to try and face it but how they do that will take time and it will have to happen in stages and through various mediums so hopefully through art and through you know films mm -hmm. and and music and events and those kind of, you know, it's like it mobilizes you to start thinking about it yourself yeah. and trying to kind of understand it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no easy solution or answer. Um, yeah, and there's no, like you said, it's um, it's a, it's such a, it's a process, and maybe. Some of us won't even live to see the fruit of those seeds that we are sowing now, but um, the the
think the least that everyone can do um, is to see in what in what way we can untie our tongues mm. from ourselves and 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 in in our friendships and in our and in our circles, like you said. Because the thing is, when you try and look at it and try, you can't. It's nothing one person can tackle, but it's definitely something that we could all contribute to. Um, and I think that's where art, different forms of artistic expression, become so critical um, in 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 helping people move through this because it's music and and it's also realizing the the power um, that art has to move people or to you know rouse certain emotions and feelings. Um, speaking of that, um, your video silence bleeding. I haven't watched it yet, mm -hmm. but the title alone, I was like, wow, what 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 what, what was that about? Um, and also I'm really interested in in how you how you name or title title your work because I also want to understand the 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 story behind that. So firstly, talk to us about your video silence bleeding, um, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk a bit more about some of the work that you've done as well. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think okay. So with silence bleeding, that work was made in 2018 and it was part of um, the Equalities of Women exhibition in Harare at the National Gallery um, and it was part of Women's Month um, so kind of really looking into yeah the qualities and the inequalities of what women have to deal with right, right. Um, and that those inequalities unfortunately are still very present and they're still a reality um again globally with different mm -hmm. degrees um silence bleeding was specifically speaking about menstruation and menstrual health and yeah. the silence around it and the fact that it is such a taboo subject and such a stigmatized subject that yeah when you even use the word menstruation people like what did you just say how could you say that <laughs> like, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you can't say that like why you know and it's like no this is a very normal and basic process of the human body the female body and if we don't have that okay. we don't exist anymore so yeah, I think, you know, it's like, um, it's unfortunate that it's, it's, you know, I actually read up recently about it again, there's, I think, about 5,000 euphemisms, instead of saying right. menstruation or period. 5,000? 5, 5,000. You're lying. Yeah, around the world, 5,000. Wow. Different ways of saying that. So it just kind of shows you how it's still, it's almost... You know, another artist friend was saying it's like, like passing contraband or something. It's like this, like oh my god, I have to now get like a tampon or pad and having how like it's like smuggling drugs. It's like you can't even right? do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, me, I'm gonna be like you know, be like awful. So um, yeah, it's, it's really about that basically, yeah. um, and the fact that it's also so closely tied and linked with education. Um, yes. Not only education in terms of what the, this bodily function is about and that we shouldn't shame women or young girls, um, but also just actually having access to education, having being able to go to school um, mm. when you either can't, you know, afford a tampon or pad, um, or it's not available or you know whatever the specific reason is but there is um you know kind of a big problem in terms of that because if you don't have access to that then a lot of young girls trying to make alternative uh you know using mm -hmm. rags or tissues or bark and all kinds of things which you know end up being extreme health risk um, yeah. And if you then, it's also not going to be secure. So if you do bleed, uh, you're going to be, 
humiliated and you're going to be you're going to feel mm. shamed and you're going to it's a whole like social aspect to that as well um right. and so then a lot of girls don't actually go to school which means they're not getting their education which means you know it it, it leads to a lot of things um which just build, builds up to this big gap of inequality which is already there and pre-existing so it's it is really about that um and and being able to you know it was kind of a video installation in the sense that you would walk into this room with the sound of like a continuous heartbeat um and then the projection was on a, a fitted sheet um and there's this figure in the center that's covered um and this red kind of spot appears and it starts engulfing the figure um and on either side it's got these kind of more abstract um you know it's like a piece of cloth that's stained and it's trying you trying to wash out the stain but it's not really you know it doesn't ever wash out um and you can walk around it and you can see like the ghost image behind as well so it's it's quite um you know different than having to just watch it on the computer or on right. your phone which is the the only the problem you know with installation that you can't really transport that whole uh, experience onto the digital sure. realm but right. yeah it's it was quite a like i think because you could also hear the sound before you entered the room um right. and yeah it's it's very i think it was quite overwhelming to have to see that yeah i can imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um the this video actually it went to it was part of the video awards and it went to um play at the labia in cape town and i went to watch it um with my family and <laughs> it was like i was so excited i was like i can't believe i'm watching like my own movie like yeah in the cinema right. it's amazing. And congratulations for that as well thank you thanks um but then when it started i was like oh my god this is gonna be intense because you can't actually leave <laughs> the space <laughs> right we're gonna have to sit here and watch this now for like nine minutes or ten minutes and i was like okay this is really intense whereas with obviously with the installation you could come and go as you please or when you feel uncomfortable you can leave but that was like right. you're forced to see and sit and through the whole thing which was also an interesting kind of experience um yeah so that was basically <laughs> what silence bleeding was about um right. and then to, yeah i guess the names you know it's also it's a tricky thing yeah. um it sometimes kind of comes to you. I mean, you have to, it, there's a lot of thinking about it. And um, I also kind of work in a strange way that I, I would start to make something and I don't always know exactly why I'm making it, but then it kind of reveals itself to me and and I get to understand it a bit more and it's like a conversation as well. Right. Um, yeah. I, I love that. So we're just going to open up, sorry, yeah. um, for anybody, if anybody's got any, any, any questions or any contributions, because I think we've been chatting for quite a bit. Yeah. So a comment from YouTube, hang on a second. Um, sorry. Could somebody, I can't see the question anymore from Tanise. Um, let me just ask Fazai to send that. Fazai, could you please um, copy and paste the question um, in my WhatsApp so that um, we can share. Actually, if you could comment, if you could copy and paste the comments in, in my WhatsApp, then I can I can read them from here. Um, but while we're waiting for Fazai to do that, um, Olivia, you, well, we were talking about um, Strategies for survival. I mean, survival can be in your practice, and it can also be, I believe, in learning different different things. Um, so, from your collaborations, and you've collaborated with a number of people, what would you say are some of the things that you've learned that help have helped you remain sane in in work that you do, or that have helped you even 
further either upskill or develop um, the work that you're doing? Yeah. Or even I'm... just decide for yourself in life in general. <laughs> um, I'm, I've recently collaborated with David Crit Projects and um, they're based here in Johannesburg and they've got a space in New York as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, that was like an incredible kind of experience. I'm going to go and collaborate with them soon again. Um, kind of working with print making and um, seeing how that translates with my work and my mark making and uh, it's a completely different like ball game I mean I've got no no kind of training in that regard so it's it is a close collaboration with um, a printmaker Sarah Judge and um, I mean they've got a couple of printmakers so I think I'll work with them all but yeah it's it's really I think the great thing about collaboration is just that you can kind of leave your comfort zone in your little bubble of what you feel you, you can do and you can't do. Um, right. Yeah, and I think it's it's kind of just showed me, uh, I don't know, It's it was, it was quite nice when I saw the prints because it, like, it was weird. It was like kind of seeing, um, you know, an old friend for, for the first time in a long time or, or going back to like a childhood memory, like like a physical space and, and going back there and being like, oh, wait, I was here when I was like small. Oh, wow. I was like still young. Um, so that was kind of the feeling what I got from making those, those works. Yeah. And I don't actually know why, but it was just what happened for me. And that was quite a nice little surprise. And I think that's the great thing with collaboration is that there's always some sort of surprise that happens. Yeah. Um, and it is like a conversation again, right? Because you're thinking about so many different things when you're talking and when you're collaborating with someone um, and it just allows for more ideas to happen. Mm. Yeah. So I love that. So we've got a comment from YouTube by Denise Van Furen, who is here in Zimbabwe. And she says, we've been so busy in our own worlds and not really seeing anyone. So it seems lockdown has forced us to appreciate FaceTime more and possibly become more willing to having those conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great comment. Mm, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got from Henry language is a construct as a construct formulates describes or oh, see so sorry guys I'm using my phone so I'll just wait for Frank um to to, to copy and paste those comments um and questions that you have um on my whatsapp because I'm using my phone and we'll share those but thank you for that Henry we're going to read that um in a couple of moments um but yeah i think you know this is going to be interesting to, to see what's going to come out already there, there's so many different forms of, of of having these conversations okay the 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 comment has come um and henry says henry s says language as construct formulates describes um and interprets our reality so question to you, how do you think we can break through, reveal, or expose this construct? Good, good question. <laughs> okay. What do you want to do? Do you want to talk about the FaceTime one first? I don't, yes, let's start off with FaceTime and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to Frank's because we were like right in the middle of that. So do you think that FaceTime has made it possible to kind of work through some of these difficult issues? I think it would be interesting to see when we're now in a space where I can't say things are back to normal, when we are now, you know, in a, in a new experience, right? We can't say it's the new normal because it's not yet set in stone because even this whole situation keeps on evolving every day. Um, but I think it would be interesting to see how we relate to one another um, in a, you know, what is it, face-to-face? -face? 
like face-to-face -face proper proper conversations um because also again you get to draw different energies because i remember there was a, there was a time when i was having a conversation around cyber bullies right where you've got people that are very vocal that are like real macho you know those like keyboard warriors and then when it comes to like face to face um no way to be seen and i think this is also um evident in, in in how we are having these conversations around different things now i think we've also now developed a different layer of virtual intimacy it would be interesting to see how more women will be able to have these conversations um, in places where we are not, where there's no barrier, there's no technological barrier, because even in that way, interpretation in language, there are different layers of translation. Um, when 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 you see or perceive something that you read, or a tone that you get in the monotone voice note, or even in the conversation that we're having now, the energy that we're going to be having when we are able to have other conversations in, in the physical environment um the i think the outcome will be completely different as compared to what we have now right now we've got um because we're all collectively going through the same pandemic right we're all in this space where we are dealing with different things and we are kind of now all like we're being realigned in our focuses but i do think that this is the first step <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's like classic. I love it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> well, anyway, so these are some things, you know, like working yeah. from home, and you yeah. know, people forget that you've got calls. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, it's like. Totally lost my train of thought now. But anyway, like we're saying, right? It's, it's because I think this is definitely the first step, I believe, to us willing to have these conversations. Because I don't think there would have been any way or any time where we would have had these conversations in a physical um, setting where we would have been able to pause and think and then move through. But what I do think, I think this, what we're going through now is essential that when yeah. we do get together again, um, we have a lot more empathy for each mm -hmm. other. Um, we've got a lot more time to actually listen to what the other person is saying, not hear what they say. The thing is, um, what I've noticed for myself is that I've taken so many things for granted in that when we have conversations of this nature before, people want to or tend to want to um, exert their knowledge or impart their knowledge but not necessarily dissecting it um for people to to get just out of layman terms just mm -hmm. basics i think this is going to help us go back to basics and go back to the drawing board i don't know what do you think yeah totally i think and the nice thing about what you were saying just now is that kind of being able to be part of it but also have that moment of reflection yeah. Um, which is crucial, right? If you don't have that kind of little, little bit of time to step back and kind of think about it, then I feel like I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I feel like it's almost very hard to change, um, you know, everyone's mindset all at once. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen without again without being pessimistic but just kind of having that um knowing that um That's that it is going to take time still mm. but totally like like you were saying we are um you know it's very rare i don't think we'll ever in our lifetime go through you know as everyone around the world through this kind of thing again who knows maybe but you know it, the whole you know we're all in this storm and i i was also mm. this the other day we're all in the same storm but we're on in, on different boats which is a big right. difference <laughs> right so if you're like you know, a little lifeboat you know and you're like not in a great position in that storm and that's it's important like being on a cruise ship or not so that's also that's important to kind of realize uh it's not yeah 
yeah easy for everyone and of course it's yeah um there's again a lot of inequality um that needs to kind of be dealt with but i totally think that um I mean, just again, having to look at what's happening in America now, I mean, that's like next level in, in the sense that it's not the first time that yep. um, an innocent black man was killed by the police. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but this is like a complete total outrage. And, um, right. and you, and I do wonder if it's part of the lockdown. I don't know, like if that's if that. That's what I wanted to ask. Mm. Is that um, because of lockdown, um, mm. it's forced people to to actually be more aware? Because mm. come on, this has been happening from like the sixties. This is nothing yeah. new. Yeah. But I think um, people's fragility has been heightened and amplified by lockdown. So I, I I'm also wondering that mm, guys. If you had to be going on your commute and having to go around your day, you really be going and doing what you're doing. But then again, mm -hmm. I think that it had to happen in this time for us to realize. And I also, I think it's also aggravated by how many deaths, right? How many, how many, and not that death is necessary, but like how many people had to die for us to get to this point. Mm -hmm. And I think also the fact that because of, you know, COVID-19, and other things, right? People have been dying on mass. That I think also the lockdown period has helped people realize that life is too short to pursue things that are meaningless. Because again, it is that that thing we're talking about around what language do you address yourself with? And when you're alone with your own thoughts. And take the last um the last question, then we're gonna wrap up. Um, and this is from Henry X again. Thank you for this, Henry. And he says, um, Henry or Henri, I don't know. Um, and he says, language <laughs> as a construct formulates, describes, and interprets our reality. How do you think we can break through, reveal, or expose this construct? It's quite a big one. That's you a big start. one. <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, you know, I remember we did, what is it called? Semiotics or something. Yeah. And it's like, you know, this is called a tree, but why do we call it a tree? We could have called it a, a dog, right? And right. also when we think, when I think of a tree, I'm thinking of a different tree than you, what you might be thinking of. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's like this weird thing, like language in itself is crazy just how, and it's interesting, obviously, how we've started with it um, and where it's come to. And as I'm busy reading um, 1984 um, sure. and it talks, I mean, it's like amazing. I'm just like halfway and I'm like, I need to take a break now, <laughs> but then I'll get back to it. But it's, it's also, it talks about um, Newspeak, I think, and how they basically are breaking down English language to be like this obsolete thing, you know, where it's like, um instead of having you know beautiful you'll have you know unbeautiful or you, you won't have ugly you'll have unbeautiful and beautiful it's like a total like kind of scrapping away all the words and and i think right. it's important how yeah i don't know like i don't know i think it's i was also thinking earlier about how in hong kong which I think um, a lot of people speak Cantonese, if I'm not mistaken, and how Midla mainland China is now trying to obviously kind of reclaim Hong Kong. And that's all like another political thing. And, and I was listening to one um, lady who said, you know, they're also trying to take away our language. And that's wow. like the first yeah. step of, you know, kind of wiping cultural identity of a place and the people. So, yeah, I think, it's I don't know Henry. <laughs> Henry. I have no idea how to answer this question. I don't know if you want to give a go, but obviously yeah, it's important. I'm joking. <laughs> I, <won't. laughs> 
Um, but actually, I will, I, will, I will give a go, but I'm not necessarily to, to address the, the question or Henri's comment, um, but just to add to what you're saying. Um, let me reread that. Maybe if somebody wants to, to, to you know, um, unmute themselves, they are more than welcome to. Language, uh, actually, Henri would like to add on. That would really help, I suppose. Language as a construct formulates, describes, and interprets our reality. How do you think we can break through, reveal, or expose this construct? And the word that exploded on my screen was expose this construct because um, I believe that every generation, right, has got a role to play in preserving, whether it's the customs or the language or the the different things about who they are culturally as a people, which is why for me, I'm now speaking in my dialect more, which is my Nika, who grew up and raised in Harare, but our family um, and our lineage is from Banyika land province. And now how do we preserve these things um, when one language, i.e. English in particular, is used as a measure of of, of, of different things, whether we acknowledge them or not. So I think that's something that, you know, I think we need to nibble on. But if Henry or Henri would like to unmute himself and um, we would love to hear Hi. your thoughts further on that. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, that was awkward. Sorry, was can I you pronouncing hear me? your name properly? Yes, we can. It's just actually a, a nickname, well, a shortening of Henrietta. Um, uh, it's perfect, cool. thank you. Um, no, I was just, this is, this is like a very broad and almost metaphysical kind of question right. in a way, because I just feel like there's so many words that are so loaded um, and they have been created. Language has been constructed. Um, and I just feel that it's in many ways it can be considered quite biased because of how it's been constructed. And I'm not necessarily talking about all languages, but right. I just feel, um, so I just, I always kind of like want to question um, mm. how language is used because it's also used uh, in a political sense. It's used in a emotional, mm. it's used in an abusive sense. It's used in so many, and also in a positive sense, of course, I'm not going sure. just on the one side. But I just think that, um, just asking that question, not taking mm -hmm. language away, but being careful or considered or just exposing what it has kind of been constructed to say. Mm -hmm. And is yeah. that a description or is that a definition? And I think that, you know, the difference between description and defining something, when you define something, you go deeper. And when you describe mm. something, it can be more surface level. And I think that we have to be careful to not um, just describe, but to try and define. And then you get into the whole question of what is definition and whose definition. Mm. And yeah, just the layering. So, Perfect. Uh, and Thank so, you so I was just wanting that. to hear Olivia's opinion on that, considering that she's working on language and through language and with language. Perfect. Thank you so much. Olivia? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I was saying earlier as well, this idea of definition and what Henry was saying as well, you know, we need to be cautious as to, you know, having a definition of whatever it is that we want to define and whose definition is that, right? Who, where is it coming from? What's that, that person's agenda? Um, so, yeah, I think maybe that's, again, where I guess conversation becomes quite important and having conversations with um, a range of people with different backgrounds and different um, skill sets and, um, you know, like, just knowledge, really. Um, mm. Because that's the only way I think you can truly start to be considerate in terms of the language that you do use, of course. Um, right. And I think it also, we need to be careful when we start to, you know, kind of, because there's also this thing where we start to take away, we almost like move away from 
the actual problem so much because of the language that we are using that we aren't even addressing the problem anymore, right? It's kind of wow. become so PC or whatever you want to call it that you're not actually addressing the problem, right? This is the problem. Poverty is a problem, right? We're not, we can't oh. call it, doesn't matter what we call it, like, but if we do, you know, and this is, I think, what what has also struck me from the book that I'm reading is this kind of idea of breaking down the language so that it's so basic and that we stop kind of looking at the actual problem, you know? Um, sure. So I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a real answer to that. <laughs> I don't know if I answered the question at all, but I think it's, yeah. it is through conversations um, and through collaboration, collaborations and, um, yeah, I mean, reading, writing, trying to engage as much as you can. Um, and again, whether it be through a physical, you know, reading a book or if it's reading an artwork or listening to a song, um, you know, all that, it gives you information, gives you mm -hmm. a sense of understanding of what was happening for that person at that time. But like you were saying as well, uh, Rotendo, is the, you know, the idea of when you put something out in the world, right. whether it be a piece of music or, uh, you know, photograph or installation, everyone's going to have a different understanding of that work. Um, sure. And that's the beauty of it as well, right? Is that right. There's no clear, defined answer. There's no right answer, I think. But it is about having a conversation and and through that conversation being able to um you know put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand mm. and listen um yeah. which is difficult right yeah. yeah yeah it is and i also forgot to mention that um you know olivia you're also a resident artist at bag factory in johannesburg um, Raphael uh, also just commented saying, I've always admired your work and what really inspired and, and what really inspired the powerful work you do that really interrogates womanhood. Um, and he asks, where do you see yourself in the African art scene? Um, and perhaps talk a bit about your experience at the Bag Factory Studios. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um... Thank you, Raphael. That really means a lot. Um, I think it's hard to kind of, you know, this idea of the African art scene. Um, I almost, you know, it's important to look at my own history, uh, knowing that I'm a descendant from, you know, I think Dutch or German or wherever, you know, I'm. A white settler uh, in South Africa and right. it's, it's kind of hard that that idea of identity within a place or space and I think I think it's also important to recognize that but I think it's also um, important to kind of again and I think that's maybe where breaking this definition having to fit into those definitions um, where I sometimes think it's, we need to deconstruct that as well, right? Mm -hmm. So to define myself as a um, this or that kind of artist, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a woman artist, why is it not just an artist, right? Artist. Um, sure. Right, so that kind of idea is, uh, is important. So I think, of course, being based on the African continent is, is important because that's where I am, that's what I know, that's my home. Um, but it is also important to kind of think about it on a global kind of scale, right? What does it mean to be a contemporary artist maybe, right? Now. Yeah, sure. Mm, and I don't know, it's hard to say really, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've only really gone, I, I feel like if I want to address this question, I would love to see the rest of the continent, first of all, to be able to kind of, really understand where yeah. I position myself, right? Where I see That's myself true. in the art scene. Uh, art scene. But the, the great thing about the Bag Factory has been to meet artists from, you know, around the world and, um, you know, from the rest of Africa as well, which has been fantastic. And that, um, 
yeah, that kind of gives you a sense of where you fit in or how you fit in in, in that kind of context. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, I, I'm not really sure how to exactly answer that question. You know, how no, I, I think you answered it perfectly. And then again, I think everything comes down to, and that's another thing. Also, if you look at how, number one, also because of lockdown and because of technology, um, there are no more, don't, there's, there's no, we're not confined to geographical borders. Um, so it's, 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 it's now, and how do we define who we are in the space that we are um, from a global, globalized perspective? Um, but we could literally talk for hours. Um, I mean, you have to wrap it up, but I really, really enjoyed um, chatting with you and thank you so much. So for those that are, you know, have watched and joined us, thank you so, so much. Unfortunately, um, we can't take any, any more questions or comments. Um, but Olivia for, okay, wait, we've got another question from Raphael. And I think this is an important one. Let me, let me, we'll end with this one. <laughs> um, okay, so he says, being at the back factory with its history and its founding fathers like the late David Koloane, and others what do you understand about the history of the studio okay all right yeah i mean of course um the bag factory was founded basically when i was born which is fantastic because it's like it feels very special to me to have it um be as old as i am um yeah, next year it's turning 30 and as am I. So <laughs> that's, that's a nice thing to celebrate um, as well. But I mean, of course the space was created because of the lack of access and accessibility, um, you know, especially during the apartheid regime in South Africa um, and segregation um, before that. So it was a space where artists can, um, you know, meet regardless of uh, ethnicity or race and beliefs. Um, and it's really just a space where you can create art. Um, and I right. think you know, that's still the idea of the Back Factory. Um, Pat is still there. He's a co-founder of the Back Factory and he's, um, he's just like the heart and soul of the place really. Um, no. And yeah, it's like really special to be there and be able to be part of this incredible, um, institution in a way, um, space, um, creative hub, and yeah. you know, you like I was saying earlier, you get to meet artists from the rest of the continent and and the world, wow. um, and you get to really kind of immerse yourself in the culture of Johannesburg, which is like mm. I was saying earlier, completely different to say Cape Town, which is my hometown. Um, sure. Yeah, so if you, you know, whoever, if we can go back again to um, allowing people to come visit us and when, when everything is safe, definitely have to come see us there. Yeah. No. Perfect. Um, and then Raphael just commented again saying uh, that's his friend that they traveled the world together. So thank you yeah. so much for those closing remarks, um, Raphael, as well as you, Olivia, um, and as well as everybody, thank you to everybody that shall watch this rebroadcast. It will be available on um, YouTube. For those that um, would want to you know, see more of your work or connect with you online, uh, could you share your details, please, Olivia? Yeah, sure. You can find me on Instagram. It's just my name and my surname, Olivia Boita Studios, and you'll find me there. That's probably the easiest. Also, you can go to the Bag Factory, um, the website as well. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And you can connect with um, National Gallery of Zimbabwe on Instagram. Um, our handle is at Nat Gallery Zim. That's N A T G A double R. Jokes. Let me take that again. That's N A T G A double L E R Y Z I M. Um, and then on Facebook, it is National Gallery of Zimbabwe, if you'd like to connect with me as well, on social media. My Instagram um, and Facebook handle is just the same. It's Rutendo Mutamwira. So that's R-U-T-E-N-D-O-M-U-T-S-A-M-W-I-R-A. -E -E that brings us to the end of this week's edition 
of Harare conversations has been an absolute treat hanging with you. I really enjoyed myself. So <laughs> when, just a little disclaimer, so yesterday I was sending uh, Olivia some voices. I was like, man, I'm freaking out. I'm going to be <laughs> able to talk for more than 15 minutes. And now it's like well over an hour. Yeah. Um, so we, we, I think we did good. We did good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So much. You're welcome. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and everybody else enjoy and please take it easy and yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And you. All right. Yes. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>